Perfect. Yeah, super. So, welcome everyone to this uh, third uh, session this uh, afternoon in Chile. Uh, as as before, we we will plan to to get your question by either chat or uh, at the end by by turning on your microphones and giving the questions. And also at the end, we are going to have uh, some propaganda for for you to know Chile. Uh, so uh, it's for me a pleasure to introduce you to next speaker. He's a senior to Lupercio. He's from the Departamento de Matemáticas in Simvestal, que es el Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Mexico City. Uh, he will talk us about quantum topic geometry. So, Lupercio, please, thank you for, for being here. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, uh, for now, I will have my camera off because the bandwidth may take a toll, but at the end of the questions, I, I turn it on. Also, because I'm going to be writing on the screen, and then it's kind of funny to, to point the camera to the sailing. So, in any case, uh, I'm going to be talking about this quantum toric geometry that we have been developing. Uh, who is we is uh, Ludmil Katsarkov at the University of Miami, Laura Mersemont uh, at the University of Angers in France, and Alberto Verhoski at UNAM in Cuernavaca in Mexico. And we have been working developing a generalization uh, of, um, so this is a, a generalization of toric geometry, generalizes toric geometry uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, so we, let's see. So uh, to begin with, uh, what reference am I using? Uh, well, I, I'm using uh, uh, this paper uh, that is a 2014 paper where we kind of uh, described or announced and proved some basic properties of the theory. Back then we used to call them non-commutative toric varieties, but this was confusing. Uh, of course, in quantum theory, uh, x, y is not y, x for the coordinates. Uh, unlike in commutative algebra, in commutative algebra, uh, in no class, uh, classical algebraic geometry, we have this. Uh, so we, we used to call them non-commutative. But uh, this was confusing because the torus object uh, in this theory is a commutative group in non-commutative spaces. So we decided to switch the name for quantum. Uh, this is a... Uh, this is also a, a there is the so-called non-commutative torus. I will describe it in this talk. Uh, Alan Kohn. But it's also referred to as the quantum torus. So rather than we will uh, uh, we will go here and not here uh, really. Uh, it's just a terminological thing so that you don't get confused with the 2014 paper. In any case, uh, what we will really review today is the recent 2020 paper, Quantum Non-Commutative Toric Geometry Foundations that can be found on the archive. And uh, well, in this paper, we introduce quantum toric varieties, uh, which are non-commutative generalizations of ordinary toric varieties, generalizes ordinary toric geometry, where all the tori all the tori of the classical theory are replaced by quantum tori. So in the classical theory, you have tori, real and complex, real and complex tori, and all these tori in the new thing will become quantum tori. But because quantum tori are quantum non commutative spaces, I will depict them like this fuzzy kind of quantum thing just to denote that it's a torus, but it's a quantum one. And I will explain what this is, don't worry. 
uh, and then in this quantum toric geometry is a new toric geometry that contains the old toric geometry, of course, and generalizes the uh, non-trivially most of the theorems and properties of toric geometry. Uh, we will be mostly considering this quantum toric variables uh, as stacks. Uh, and uh, well, then we will have quantum fans rather than only fans. I will explain what is a quantum fan and we will have quantum geometric invariant theory. And so you have uh, I use for toric varieties in your work. Now you can generalize parts or so all of your work to the quantum realm using quantum toric varieties. Uh, but unlike, unlike classical toric varieties, quantum toric varieties admit moduli. There is a modular space there is a modular space of toric varieties. Uh, and this modular space, it didn't exist in the classical case. Why? Because this modular space, I will explain, is a complex orbifold in our case. And the rational points, the rational points, the rational points, the Q points, are the classical toric varieties. And all the points that are not rational, all the other points are the quantum ones. So you couldn't have the modular space in, with the purely classical objects because they are just this discrete set inside the, the modular space of all toric objects, quantum and non-quantum included. Okay. Now the theory we present here is a weight ranging generalization of toric geometry. Uh, and there were early, attempts and approaches uh, uh, to do generalized toric geometry to irrational to irrational polytopes and fans uh, in a number of ways. Uh, for example, Prato in 1999 associated to a irrational incomprendu to irrational polytope associated something uh, uh, something uh, some objects uh, with atlases uh, uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so she, she she associated in 1999 in comprendu an object uh, they the Bataglia and Prato elaborated that point of view that is sort of symplectic then Bataglia and Safran did something in the complex case. Then Bredler and Lunds did something in derived algebraic geometry. Uh, and Firat and Pir Ford associated in 1999 also uh, an object to an irrational polytope. Uh, Hoffman in 2020 associated some things. From the point of view of algebraic statistic, Bostingel and Sotil. And ratio and zoom from other symplectic point of view. So there is various uh, approaches uh, in this story. So and they must be uh, uh, the relations must be elucidated in the future with more clarity. In any case, we use stacks and non-commutative geometry spaces. Rather than all these approaches, uh, our approach is characterized because we use stacks and non-commutative spaces. Uh, and our theory is well, a, a completely coherent theory uh, of quantum of quantum toric geometry. In their case, they were not so they never they were not worried, not worried about the worth about quantum. Uh, and we are very much worried about the word quantum. Uh, 
because we think of our objects as deformations, deformations of the classical objects, objects, as we turn on H bar. So here is the modular space, MGN of toric, uh, toric spaces or toric varieties or toric stacks. Uh, what is G? Is the combinatorial, combinatorial type of the fan. The combinatorics of the fan. And what is N? Well, it's some mark points somewhere. So we have this modular space MGN and the parameter that the coordinates is this H bar. The H bar is the coordinates, uh, well, may belong to CN, it's many H bars, and is the parameter for the modular space. So for us, it's very important to the form classical orders, turning on the Planck constant into the quantum real. Okay, that's a kind of very schematic situation. Uh, now, classical theory of geometry. Uh, well, the classical theory of geometry, you remember, is uh, tori, tori, real, and complex play a role. Uh, so, uh, a very classical and dimensional and complex dimensional com compact we don't need to do compact in this theory, but let me concentrate on compact in these examples. Projective, we don't need to be projective, but let me concentrate on projective on this, on this story. Uh, Kähler toric manifolds can be defined, if you want, as an equivariant, equivariant, uh, projective compactification of the complex torus. So X is a compactification of the, in the simplest of cases where it's compact and predictive. And there is more general cases, of course. Uh, C star will always be C minus zero, and this will be the complex torus. And uh, so, uh, um, real tori, well, are inside the complex torus. And it acts holomorphically on the Kähler manifold. And so it has a, a, an action of the real torus. And this action is Hamiltonian. And because it is Hamiltonian, it has a moment map. And the moment map, whatever it is, uh, it's a, ma a map from your toric variety to a polytope. And in the classical case, this polytope actually is a rational polytope. This is the classical toric geometry case is a rational polytope. So there is this map from the Eutoric variety to a rational polytope. Uh, and this is satisfies moreover uh, uh, a combinatorial condition uh, in these very simplest of cases that is the dual of a triangulation of the sphere. So that's the situation that we encounter ourselves on in the simplest of cases. And here is a picture. Here you have the image of the moment map. And this is QN. Uh, and this is uh, from an, a paper uh, called Non-Commutative Geometry Indomitable. Uh, of mine that will appear on uh, notices of the American Mathematical Society in January, but it's already on the archive. Anyway, uh, I, uh, in that paper, uh, if you are not too familiarized with non-commutative geometry, uh, this is my attempt uh, to do in 20 pages justice to the field and explain the basic ideas in 20 pages or whatever, less maybe, uh, what, it, what it is that this field is. So uh, let me just say that uh, if this is the image of the moment map, this is the classical, classical case. 
Uh, the moment map is characterized because the inverse image of any point is uh, a torus. The inverse image of any point is a torus. A torus. What dimension? Well, if you are in this, the generic point, well, in this case, in which this is Q2, and this is X to the complex dimensional. So this is a four real dimensional. And this is two real dimensional, two. So, uh, well, the inverse image is going to be two dimensional. Suppose that uh, I, uh, uh, I consider all of R2, and then I take this point, then you get a two torus, real, Lagrangian. But if you did this point, the inverse image here would be a circle, a one torus. And this is a one dimensional facet of the polytope. And if you took a zero dimensional facet of the polytope, the inverse image would be a zero torus that is a point. So uh, it's always a torus, but the dimension of the tori change in this image of the moment map. And uh, and they change from zero, one, and two in this case in which n equals to two. And similarly for in the dimension. So that's the moment map. And there's a whole lot of tori. Uh, in fact, this realizes if the polytope is stratified, if the polytope is stratified, uh, then, well, you can have all these inverse images of the different phases. And uh, and they are all uh, vibrations above those phases of tori of various dimensions. This realizes the toric variety, set theoretically, of course. Just a disjoint union of tori. So there's a whole lot of real torus. And remember, X is the complexification of a complex torus. X is the compactification of a complex torus. So there is a complex torus and many real tori. Well, uh, that's the classical story. That's how the moment map looks in the classical story. Uh, the basic idea of quantum tori geometry uh, is to replace all the tori in the classical tori, all the classical tori in the classical theory by quantum tori. So we're going to replace all the tori by quantum tori. Uh, from a slightly different point of view, quantum tori geometry can be thought as a deformation with the formation parameter h bar of the whole field of tori geometry. Uh, uh, for example, you can take the nice book of Cox, Little, and Schenk take all these toric varieties, and you can deform the whole book by H bar. Uh, from many results from the classical theory have their counterparts in our quantum generalization, the probes are not entirely obvious. It's an interesting generalization. Unfortunately, this deformation is not totally trivial, but something must be done. Uh, nevertheless, it can be done. Uh, so the basic building block of our theory is the, a non-commutative deformation of the classical torus known as the quantum torus. So the quantum torus get this fancy and it's deformed by this parameter. Of course, when h bar equals zero, we recover the classical torus. So we're going to deform the classical torus. Uh, and this appeared in 1985 in the paper by Alan Kohn, non-commutative differential geometry. Uh, so the quantum to torus is a non-commutative space. And what is a non-commutative, uh, here you should say the opposite category. What is a non-commutative space? Well, essentially it's a non-commutative algebra. Modulo Morita equivalence. Uh, for me, it's a non-commutative algebra module today. It's a non-commutative algebra module of Morita equivalence. So if you have a space, traditionally, it's 
uh, uh, regular functions would be a commutative algebra. Now you get a non-commutative space, whatever it is, it's regular functions, it's a non-commutative algebra. Uh, so essentially think of a non-commutative space as a non-commutative algebra. Op uh, is the opposite functoriality. Uh, a contravariant functor uh, and uh, well these algebras often come in families like this algebra generated by two letters that holds this relation that is called well by many mathematicians this is called the non-commutative torus, torus this non-commutative algebra <coughs> notice that if h bar is zero this becomes commutative uh, and in fact, something less obvious but true is that if H bar is rational, the algebra, while not, not commutative, is secretly commutative. Namely, it is Morita equivalent to a commutative algebra. Uh, so there is this re equivalent relation called Morita equivalence that uh, sends it to a commutative algebra. But let's ignore the fact uh, this uh, uh, just think of this algebra as the non-commutative torus for now, and this algebra is meant to be the algebra of functions on some uh, on some uh, on some uh, on some non-commutative space. On this non-commutative space, its algebra of functions is this algebra. Depending on h bar which I, I think intuitively as small, but not necessarily, certainly real. Uh, well, this, this equation, this, can, this algebra can be realized as an operator algebra uh, on Hilbert space. And in fact, this equation is precisely the classical Born-Heisenberg-Jordan commutation relation from quantum mechanics in Bile exponential form. So uh, we take this algebra that comes from quantum mechanics and we think of it as uh, coming from a space. And it turns out that these purported spaces of, uh, is, uh, with uh, non-commutative coordinates are the formations of the classical torus. So uh, this algebra appears in these papers that won the Nobel Prize for, for physics, Max Born, Werner Heisenberg and Pascual Jordan. And uh, in this form, it's the exponential form in the classical work of Hermann Bale, quantum mechanics and group theory. Uh, so, and I'm lost. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. And so, uh, so, uh, so there is an, as I said, there is an important dichotomy for the parameter h bar, either it is rational or not, it's always real. Uh, and the space is truly non-commutative, only when h bar is irrational. When h bar is rational, its algebra functions, it's in the appropriate equivalence class, a commutative algebra. So, uh, and this, uh, uh, this can be interpreted as coming from geometry. It came from quantum mechanics, but it would be very nice for us if it came also from some geometric construction. And so let me describe the geometric construction that it comes from. The geometric construction that it comes from is this one, the Kronecker foliation. Ah, here it is, the Kronecker foliation. Uh, the Kronecker foliation uh, is this foliation here. You take the R2 plane and you uh, take this Z lattice group, subgroup acting or Z lattice inside R2. And if you take the quotient, you get a torus. But now what you are going to do is you are going to draw, you are going to choose some slope and fix it and call it H bar, fix it the slope and draw all the parallel lines of that slope. 
and project them. Bring this foliation to get, bring this foliation, and then you get the Kronecker foliation. And notice something very nice. If H bar is in Q, every leaf is a torus knot. But if H bar is not in Q, every leaf is dense in all of all of, F2, of the torus. And so I would like to I would like to understand what is the leaf space of the foliation. The modular space of leaves, the space of leaves, the modular space of leaves of this foliation. And the answer is the answer is that the modular space of leaves of this foliation is the quantum torus. The answer is, this is the quantum torus. This is the surprise discovered by Alan Kahn. So, uh, so the modular space is a non-commutative space. Uh, why? Well, uh, let's take this, the, that is the interesting case, the irrational case, the irrational case. If H bar is irrational, every leaf is dense. And if I just took the topological quotient to get the space of leaves of the foliation, uh, if I just took the topological quotient where E is the action of R, here R is acting on the torus. It's a dynamical system, R is acting on the torus. Uh, so, in fact, if I draw a transversal circle, if I draw a transversal circle and I take a point and let it flow in one of these leaves, it comes back and it comes back with a difference of h bar. A distance h bar in this little circle, in this transversal circle, h bar becomes the holonomy of the foliation. Actually, rotation by h bar. So the transversal gets rotated by h bar in the holonomy map, a return map, after coming back from tra traveling in this R action, uh, this dynamical system on the torus. So, uh, so once we have that understood, uh, this is the dynamical system. This is the action. Uh, well, this is the universal cover here in the torus. And then R acts there in the torus. And this E H bar is the action, action on T2R uh, by this flow by the Kronecker flow, flow of holonomy H bar. So if I just take the quotient, because every leaf is dense, this fancy space T of H bar is non hausdorff It's just a quotient space. It's non hausdorff and because this space is non hausdorff it's not a very good modular space for the leaves of the foliation. I would like a space where every point is one of the leaves of the foliation. This would be the natural candidate uh, for the modular space of leaves, but it's a non hausdorff space. So too bad. Notice that is the same thing to divide by the, this real flow, the two torus, that the transversal by the rotation. This is discrete dynamics. And this is continuous dynamics, but it's the same quotient space. It's the same quotient space because I'm choosing a point in every, at least a point in every leaf, and in fact, many in the transversal circle. So uh, we have uh, this and this. It's the same quotient space, but it's non-house. So what to do? 
Well, uh, there is uh, many things that one can do. One can do uh, uh, the non-commutative quotient. This is number one. Non-commutative geometry gives you a better quotient. In the category of non-commutative spaces, the quotient is no longer non-Hausdorff. It's a good space. In the category of topological spaces, the quotient is bad space. In the category of non-commutative spaces, thinking of the algebras of functions, is just a non-commutative algebra. It's okay. You could also use, instead of non-commutative algebras, stacks, ships of groupoids. And in the category of stacks, that's okay. Uh, uh, you, you usually pass through a topological groupoid or a smooth groupoid to get the stack. Uh, so this gets a little bit technical, but uh, this gets a little bit technical, but uh, if you have a groupoid, and what groupoid I'm going to take? I'm going to I either take T2R with the EH action, with the real action of, uh, of holonomy H bar. And this gives me one groupoid. This group action gives me, remember that groupoids contains group actions. Or I'm going to take S1 and I'm going to take the rotation by H bar. And this groupoid. These groupoids are equivalent groupoids, Morita equivalent groupoids. They give me the same stack. So if a groupoid I apply its Morita equivalence class, I get a stack. Uh, and uh, these two groupoids, for example, give me the same stack. A groupoid I, I can get its convolution algebra. And then, then I get a non commutative algebra. And the Morita equivalence class is a non commutative space. And there is a map from stacks to non commutative spaces. Every stack gives me a non commutative space, but different stacks could give me the same non commutative space. Nevertheless, not if I restrict to the category of this object that I'm going to be working, the toric objects. So in this case, it's the same to have the non commutative space as to have the stack. Uh, so for the example of the quantum torus, we get the groupoid of this real action, this real dynamical system flow on the torus, the Kronecker flow. This gives me a non-commutative algebra. Guess which one? The quantum Heisenberg uh, algebra. Exactly that one. Uh, and this is the Morita equivalence class of that algebra. This is a non-commutative space. And this is the stack associated to the groupoid. And this is convolution. So uh, I have four different avatars for the non-commutative torus. And I will have four different avatars for every quantum toric variety. This is called the quantum torus. And it has four avatars. One, two, three, I can think of it as a group action. I can think of it as a non-commutative algebra, as a stack, or as a non-commutative space. I have those four, uh, uh, four structures there. Well, uh, uh, is what I just said. There is four ways of thinking of the quantum torus. Four ways of thinking of the quantum torus. Uh, the algebra I will call the non-commutative torus, as most people, and the stack I will call the quantum torus. Very well then. Uh, uh, these are remark interesting remarks, but that I will start to skip because I'm run I'm running out of time. Uh, in any case, uh, this is important, very important. So remember, here is the the Kronecker flow. This gives me the circle with a rotation. And I'm going to take the universal cover of the circle. This is the exponential map. And I'm going to take the inverse image of one and h bar. So I'm going to consider one and h bar, uh, the subgroup generated, the additive subgroup generated, additive subgroup generated by one and h bar inside of R, the universal covering of the circle. 
and this I'm going to call gamma, and notice that it is uh, not quite a lattice inside of R, this is R, but this is uh, what quasi-crystal people call a quasi-lattice, quasi-lattice, and what I will call a quantum lattice. So this is not quite a lattice. Notice that the rank is two inside of R1. But I will, uh, uh, but it is the image. It is the image of some Z2 into R where 0, 1 goes to one and one zero goes to H bar. So such things I will call quantum lattice. Okay, so it's a quantum lattice uh, and that either having this one or having this two or having this geometric object three are together with its quantum lattice recovers the quantum torus. This quotient, this quotient stack is also the, the quantum torus and I call it this in logarithmic form. So now I have a new representation of the quantum torus that is just a quasi lattice acting on a vector space. Vector space modulo quasi lattice, quant quantum lattice is a quantum torus. But I have to go through all these and then Fourier transform to get the non commutative algebra. So it's a whole bunch of arrows to get to the non commutative algebra. Anyway, this is the quasi lattice, the quantum lattice, and I can think of it as the Lie algebra of the rotation group, if you will. And this is the quantum torus given by the quantum lattice. In general, uh, the complex quantum torus given by a quantum lattice inside of CD, and this is just always inside of RD. And this is just a finitely, finitely, genera finitely generated group, additive group. It's called a quantum lattice. And this is a d-dimensional complex quantum torus, a d-dimensional complex quantum torus. And this is, this is what I am going to compactify to get a quantum toric variety. This is what I am going to compactify to get a quantum toric variety. This one is the one that I'm going to, the complex quantum d-dimensional torus. Okay, this is stack that by via convolution produces a non-commutative algebra give, uh, where the, uh, the non-commutation is given by the coefficient, the generators of the quantum torus. In any case, uh, let's see quantum P1, the simplest possible object. Uh, of course, this lives on a fan. This is the fan of quantum P1, but the fan also has more information than in the past. It's a fan in a... Ay. Ay, ay. Estoy losing control. It's a fan inside a quantum lattice. This, a fan inside a quantum lattice is called a quantum fan. So CP1 was C star zero infinity. Now CP1 quantum is I take this quantum torus. Notice the one here, careful with the one there. This D down here, it was a D plus one at the top. So careful there, this is, could be potentially confusing. This comes from this Kronecker foliation in T2. This comes from this Kronecker foliation uh, in T2. And, uh, and I take that quantum torus and I compactify that quantum torus using the transversal and all that. So, uh, 
Well, we will use two charts with the, this stack. These stacks are classically are non-separated. If I just thought of the stacks naively and non-algebraic, but I'm working with the stacks over a toric side, the tails in the paper. I'm working for stacks over a toric side and then it's okay. In any case, uh, I get a coordinate here and I imagine this as a, one of these orbifold charts, except that the stabilizer here is uh, Z or more. And then this becomes really a quantum torus, not a torus. And well, anyway, I can describe a chart, this non-commutative this stack or non-commutative space. Uh, when gamma, of course, when h bar is irrational, when h bar is rational, you just get the usual orbifolds. When h bar is rational, you just get the usual orbifolds. Or the Lynn Monfort stacks. Uh, so that's that. Uh, well, I'm going to skip a little, little bit this part, which is fascinating. Uh, and let me go to, to this part. Uh, uh, how, how am I to think of the complex structure in, the, in P1, uh, in, this, in, in this P1, this quantum P1? Well, a nice way to think about it is uh, in the following terms. Think of P1 as Uh, S3, this is S1 cross S3, this is a hop surface. And then this is the Riemann surface, the Riemann sphere. And this is essentially the hop vibration in S3. And then you get S1 cross S1, that is an elliptic curve, and you get an elliptic vibration. So, uh, well, the basic idea is that when the elliptic curve is closed into an elliptic curve, I can still take here, I can still take here the universal cover. And so I get C is one cross S3, but of course C winds on itself into elliptic curves to form this vibration. And now I perturb holomorphically this. And when I perturb holomorphically this, the C doesn't close up on itself anymore. And now the leaves of the volition are really C, but this becomes quantum P1. The leaves are dense in large areas, in large parts. So rather than this nice, this is a classical, and this is the quantum. Rather than having these nice uh, elliptic curve leaves on this foliation for the uh, hop surface with modular space of leaves, classical P1, then when you perturb this holomorphically, you get these leaves that go all, all about all over the place. And the modular space of leaves of that crazier foliation is quantum P1. And, uh, but because the foliation is transversally Kähler, notice that the Hof surface is not, uh, not Kähler, it's not symplectic. Uh, so uh, in general, you, uh, you could think the same for PM minus one cross PM minus one with the uh, Galabi Eggman vibrations. And more generally, uh, uh, LBM manifolds generalize the situation for any toric variety. Uh, projective, compact, toric uh, variety. So you could still do this with LBM manifolds as it is uh, uh, for projective toric varieties. And you could deform in this way the toric variety into a non-commutative toric variety uh, 
using this, uh, at least for the predicted case, using this LBM manifest. Uh, this gets, oh, again, technical, has to do with the stacks, but the point is that uh, uh, I need to remember uh, some additional topological information. If I have a toric variety and I deform it into a quantum toric, and then I deform back, what I really get is this together with a gerb, with a canonical gerb. Physicists would say you turn on the gerb. And this gerb is called, a, we call it a calibration. And you can ignore it if you don't, uh, but it's technically very important to produce the modular space. Uh, Part of the issue is the same that would happen if you have the Kronecker foliation that is all winding down. All of a sudden it closes into torus knots, classical. But then if you would want, to, uh, if you deform back and so, then you all of a sudden you remember at every point a Z stabilizer and this is the year. It's a technical thing. Uh, I just wanted to say something about it. Uh, well, uh, what is a quantum fan? This is a quantum fan. A quantum fan is a classical fan, just a fan, but it, it doesn't need to lie inside QN. R rather than classical fans, this needs to lie inside a quantum lattice, which may be rational. So I need to remember the quantum lattice, the fan, the combinatorial structure of the fan. And I need, because now there is no primitive vector at every ray, I need to, to choose, just choose these vectors on the rays. And this is a quantum fan. Gamma, very often, most often than not, is dense in R D. Uh, you can think of a higher dimensional lattice, higher dimensional lattice mapping into gamma. And in fact, that's what we call uh, a calibrated quantum fan. When we remember these kind of generators, these lattice bigger, generally, that maps into your gamma, then this is H and H, that is one plus H bar, uh, is the deformation parameter of the modular space. Imagine that I start rotating this big lattice here, and then the gamma, the dense gamma in RD starts changing shape, and then I can change the shape of my fans. So it's the deformation parameter of the modular space. And as I said, now we're going to form the modular space with fixed combinatorics for the fan. And this N is precisely the, uh, the, these points. Where these end points went to. And then uh, this modular space, G is, you are to think that is the, like the genus of the toric variety, the combinatorial type of the, of the fan, uh, well, determines the topology. So we call it, the, G, the topology of the uh, non commutative space, the rational topology of non commutative space. So we think of it as the quotation, quotation, the genus of the variety, just the combinatorial type of the fan. And uh, N, well, it's some sort of mark points. Then from this picture, we get uh, one of these quantum toric varieties associated to this fan, to the quantum fan to the quantum fan. This is the quantum toric variety associated. 
is a stack over the side of the toric manifolds. Uh, in any case, these uh, associated to this structure, the modular space of all these objects, well, forms this modular space, and it is a complex orbifold. So we managed to form the modular space of toric varieties. Uh, the relation between remember the calibration and not remembering the calibration. Uh, and in the case, the category of simplicial and Andre, uh, Antoine, Antoine Boava, uh, has uh, uh, written a very beautiful paper where he generalizes our setting, but it's this, it, it is the same story, a beautiful generalization of, the, of our story to the non simplicial case of calibrated quantum toric varieties is, is equivalent to the category of quantum toric fans, morphisms included. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and you can take a calibrated, uh, of course, calibrated. And then you can take the uncalibrated version of this statement as well. Uh, but the uncalibrated modular spaces are very bad. The uncalibrated modular spaces are not complex orbifolds. They lie be below the calibrated modular spaces that are complex orbifolds. It's like if you didn't mark points uh, in the modular space, this is the uncalibrated, uncalibrating. And then when you don't mark points, well, the modular space becomes worse. So you need to, to have the calibration to get a nice modular space. Okay, we have ge geometric invariant theory, but I'm running out of time. Geometric invariant theory is uh, uh, uses, let me just say the, cl the clue words, the Gale transform and LBMB theory, these LBM manifolds that generates Calabi Eggman vibrations and uses all that story. In any case, uh, uh, we are able to represent uh, calibrated, if ha we have a calibrated fan, we can pre present cali uh, in terms of, uh, well, this is uh, open set, open classical toric variety. And then some, you're like in geometric invariant theory. Is this kind of thing given by combinatorics. And then an action. And then uh, we are able to present in a geometric invariant theory. And we call calibrated quantum geometric invariant theory the toric varieties. Uh, generalizing the classical geometric invariant theory. Uh, the uncalibrated one uh, is, tells me that there is this manifold and there is this holomorphic foliation. And there is this transversal and then there is this holonomy. And this holonomy groupoid of this foliation the stackification also gives me the quantum theory variety, but uncalibrated. So we have geometric invariant theory for the quantum case uh, in terms of holomorphic foliations. Uh, well, one can elaborate. Uh, one can show that theorems like this one that you would expect a quantum toric uh, is scalar if and only if it's polytope. So collinearity and polytopality is the same thing. We use some results from Hiroaki Ishida. And uh, well, let me just finish and because I'm running out of time. Uh, just mentioning that, uh, well, we managed to get this modular space uh, for, uh, for the calibrated, we fix the combinatorics, we take some mark gerb, and then blah, 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 we can get the modular space. And the modular space 
in the in most important cases, is a complex orbifold. The rational points are the classical toric orbifolds. The irrational points are the truly quantum ones, the quantum toric stacks, compactifying the quantum torus. The most, uh, I, the most symmetric points, for example, this is really how the modular space of, uh, of quantum P1s look like. The orbifold point of the modular space is classical P1 because it's the most symmetric one. Then you get all the rational points that are the, the, the footballs orbifolds. And then you get the irrational ones. And in the paper, we compute uh, explicitly several of these modular spaces. Uh, these are more fanciful in, uh, shape of this modular space for higher dimensions and blah, blah, blah. We compute the dimension of the modular space in terms of uh, the, the combinatorial data, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now we are working on, we have already results on the compactification of the modular space. Uh, but let me just stop here. Uh, this was a very, quick whirlwind tour of the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So please, let's thank the speaker. So, uh, Mauricio, do you see some question in the chat? Uh, I, 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 the, the, there is no question in the chat, but maybe you can just leave the floor open for people to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, please. If no anyone, one wrote down anything. Yeah, if anyone want to ask, please uh, mute yourself and ask, please. No? So if... Uh,